I got to figure out what I'm going to preach on now. <laughs> now, actually, Steve's the one that should get some commendation because I found his email last night at 10 minutes after 11. And he asked, What passage was I going to be preaching on this morning? So he had less time to get ready for this than I did. But there are some interesting little quirks in this passage that I'd like to point out. And um, a man by the name of James Foster Reese, who worked for the Board of Pensions for years and years and years, he might still be working for them, even though he's well past retirement age. He said, I have... I'd like to say a few words before I begin to speak. And there are a few words about this passage that I'd like to lift up just because I think they're of interest and they may help people understand a little bit. Part of it was the fact that this, this iconic picture and any number like that have been done and they've been drawn from this particular passage of Scripture. And the, the interesting thing of note is in the pictures, there are never doorknobs. So the, that message is, is quite clear that, that there is a responsibility on our part to, to make some kind of response to the overture that Christ makes to us. And I think that's an order that's important for us to remember. We sometimes think we're the actors first, but we're always the reactors. And it's Jesus extending the invitation first. I served as an executive presbyter for the last 22 years of my ministry. And I think I was fairly good at that. There are some other folks out there, and I can give you some of them by name, that would challenge that. But one of the things that you get to do as an executive presbyter is that you don't relate to individual congregational members or Christians the way pastors of local churches do. And you learn fairly quickly something that shows up in the, the seven churches streak of passages that we're in with this passage today. And the writer of Revelation calls it the angel of the church. I wasn't quite so theological, but congregations take on personalities. They have a quality about them as a congregation an aura, if you will. And one of the things that the writer of Revelation is, is putting out there is that there are these seven churches that each have this angel or this personality or this aura. And unfortunately, the one that I've chosen for today is this aura or personality of being just kind of lukewarm being comfortable with things the way they are. I want to talk a bit more about that a little later on, but the other is an image that's really kind of gross, and I kind of wish maybe that Steve would have talked to the kids about God spitting people out of his mouth. Uh, it's not exactly the picture of the loving God that we have. And I don't know how accurate it is, but in my reading, I understand that in the part of the world where Laodicea was found, there were mineral springs. And it was an image that would have been of some familiarity to people. Mineral springs have interesting qualities about them. We tend to... to to be more aware of the quality of when they're hot because they're therapeutic and healing. And we have them in this country and people flock to them to, to sit in this wonderful warm water to soak our aches and pains away. My understanding is that if they're icy cold, they have a refreshing quality to them. 
as I've been experiencing the last two or three days as I try to battle the heat and work on our front and back decks. Uh, water, cold water, can pick you up a little bit. And I am most gracious to my wife for being ready to run to the refrigerator and refill my bottle because about two drinks and it's gone. But when it's lukewarm and you take a drink of it, it tends to trigger in us a gag reflex. And the only way that we can handle that is to spit it out. We can't seem to get it swallowed. So that's the, the image that, that the writer is lifting up for us. That if you're just plain lukewarm, you know, if you're not refreshingly cold or therapeutically hot, God can't swallow that. What is the personality of this church? You know, I think I'd, I'd lift up some possibles. You know, there, we have a personality that is kind of grown up around the relationship with El Salvador. We have a personality that has kind of grown up around our relationship with Cross Ministries and the backpack program or the first Sunday offerings. We have a personality that has kind of grown up around serving the meal at the homeless shelter. Now, I'd like to lift up for you the possibility there are two or three things that, that work toward becoming lukewarm. One is that for churches, the longer they have been in existence, the greater the tendency is to get comfortable with life. And even though we are the baby of this presbytery, we are now 25 years old. Anybody realize that we have a big birthday this year? Actually, it passed last Easter but we didn't catch it until we were looking at some history stuff because a man by the name of Dave Espy wants to put a page on our website that tells a little bit of Heartland's story. And all of a sudden, two weeks after the anniversary, we woke up to the fact that we'd missed our birthday. My understanding is that there are plans yet for us to celebrate somehow, somewhere, some way. But we've been around long enough to start to get comfortable. There's another factor that can lead to lukewarmness. And that is having too many passions that we get divided and splintered and going all sorts of different ways. And I'm going to sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth right now, but uh, part of what I have been working on with this congregation since January is trying to recapture a passion for hospitality. And one of the things that the committee and I have discovered as we work on that is that you can't confine hospitality to one little committee of four people. Uh, it takes more than that. It, it's, it needs all of us working together, especially if we want that to become our personality. Another thing we've discovered over that period of time is that there is almost never a Sunday that goes by that we don't have 
somebody worshiping with us for the first time. We tend to call them visitors. I prefer to think in terms of their being guests. They're in our house with us and we need to welcome them. I think another thing that that Alex is trying to lead us toward as a congregation with his mission discernment group is trying to help us see all these other little passions as working toward a more focused big passion. And I'm just lobbying for hospitality to be one of those passions. I've already told you we have some guests in worship this morning. Actually, I mentioned two, but there are more than that. And I wonder how many of you are sitting out there who have turned to somebody and said, who's that up there in the second row? You know, uh, we've noticed there's somebody new amongst us, but we're afraid to go and speak to them ourselves. Or maybe there's a couple of new people in the band today, and we haven't gone up to say hello to them. And generally speaking, there's a, there's a common fear behind that. One is I'll embarrass myself by speaking to somebody who's actually been here longer than I have. But you don't have to give that away. All you have to do is say, hello, my name is Bob Hauser. And I've experienced with a couple of folks as I've tried to do that, and that, that goes against my personal nature, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I don't go up and, and greet strangers easily. But as I have done that, I've run into a couple of you folks who say, hi, I'm glad to meet you. And they don't tell me anything more. But 95 times out of 100, if you say, hello, my name is Bob Hauser, or, or whatever your name really is, they're going to give you practically all the information that you want. And on some rare occasions, they may give you more than you care for. But that's all to the good. And if you discover that they have been here longer than you have, you can put on your list a new friend and neighbor in Christ. I've got to tell a story, and it's going to show up in the newsletter. So those of you who don't remember it, uh, I was blessed with uh, a wonderful father-in-law. My father-in-law had a passion. He was a farmer, and he raised hogs, but that wasn't his passion. He did that so he could afford to have an airplane. He got his pilot's license and his little Cessna 170 when he was probably in his middle 50s. Uh, But we discovered around the kitchen table, which is now our dining room table, one time going through some old papers that my father-in-law had written a paper for school when he was in the I think the fifth grade, and it was all about flying airplanes. My father-in-law's passion was such about flying airplanes that he wanted all of the rest of you to have that experience as well, and that you might enjoy it as much as he did. And so he was the best person to take your first flight with because he was not going to do any of those big deep dives and swoops and stuff that, that would turn your stomach upside down. No, he was going to, to give you the best plane ride you could possibly have for your first one. Because, see, he wanted you to love flying as much as he did. My father was deathly afraid of airplanes. And I can't tell you how long it took my father-in-law working on my father, but he got him up for his only plane ride ever. And he enjoyed it. He wasn't going to go for another one. (laughs) 
but the one he had was something to remember. I don't care whether it's El Salvador or the homeless mission or hospitality or vacation church school or the website or whatever it is. What are you passionate about? What is it that you would like everybody else here to experience? I lay out that one of my passions is, is being hospitable. This congregation has been in this sanctuary for really only a very brief period of time in its history. And I have learned that there are some of you that went to the early service and some of you that went to the late service and you never met each other in spite of the best efforts of pastor and others to help that happen. My hope and my prayer is that you will seek out the people in here that you do not yet know whether they're a guest for the first time or whether they have been coming here for 25 years. Get to know them so that we can really and truly become the body of Christ to the glory of Christ's kingdom. Amen.